Okay, you guys ready? Let's do this. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself in this session. This is supposed to be an introduction to the Quran. Um, um, the, the way I introduce people to the Quran is very personal. It's not a generic like pre-made PowerPoint presentation or a book that I'm using as a basis. I'm actually using my own experience as a basis to introduce you to this book. I was actually, um, as I was raised, I was raised a Muslim, but I wasn't really raised in a, in a tradition where I studied the Quran or learned its meaning or even went through the whole thing in translation ever. So I didn't really know what it was. And I wasn't exactly religiously affiliated by the time I got to college in New York City. I went to school in New York City. And when I did kind of decide to rediscover my faith for myself, I actually happened to be living on my own. My parents had already moved away. And I was living on my own, so I kind of was kind of learning the religion on my own terms, not on the family's terms or you know, the terms of any sort of mosque or, or religious institution. It was kind of a self-discovery type of thing. And I realized very quickly after reading the Quran in uh, translation that seemed very Shakespearean, that I'm not going to be able to relate to this book because the, the text is too difficult for me to process. Okay? So there are some challenges that any reader, including myself, have already faced in trying to understand the Quran. And the first of them was that it actually doesn't read like any other book. It's, it's got 114, you guys call them chapters, we call them surahs, but it's not really chapters. I mean, a chapter, by definition, is supposed to be progressive. In other words, when you finish chapter one of a book, chapter two should build off of chapter one, right? And if something comes up from chapter one again, the author simply cites, go back to one, it's there. Page this and this and this, right? So that's typically how chapters work. And sequencing of chapters is totally important. You can't take a book that was made of 12 chapters and make chapter 3 into chapter 12. You can't do that. The author's intent doesn't come out the same way. When you look at the Quran, the first thing you notice is uh, uh, there are different kinds of order. Like uh, these 114 surahs, surah instead of chapter, right? S-U-R-A-H, by the way, those of you that are writing this down. Surah, instead of what? Chapter. chapter. And how many of them? 114, right? You could have organized them a number of ways. Maybe they could have been organized in subject order, which would be the typical way to go in a book, right? You organize book, a book by subject. It's not the case. It's clearly not the case as you study the Quran. Another possible order could be chronological. Obviously, we, we believe that the Quran was revealed over the course of 23 years. Little by little, revelation came to the Prophet, and it was memorized. Because it's originally an oral tradition. It's not a written tradition. It's an oral tradition. So it was memorized. And so you figured the first thing that was memorized must be chapter one. The second thing that was, was memorized must be chapter two, etc., etc., etc. The fact of the matter is the first revelation that came, you will find it almost at the very end. If the book is 600 pages, you'll find it on 587 or something. That's the first revelation. So it's clearly not in what kind of order? It's not in chronological order. So it's not in subject order. I just mentioned that. It's not in chronological order. That's the second challenge for a modern reader. A third challenge for a modern reader is that it's not in size order. You figure maybe the biggest chapters are in the beginning and the smallest ones are at the end. No, not the case. The first one's really small, the second one's pretty big, actually the biggest. The third one's a pretty sizable. Then they're big and then they get small and then big again, and then it's small and then big again. So it's not in size order, it's not in subject order, it's not in chronological order. A Western reader like myself, for the first time when I read the whole thing, I said, there is no order. There can't be any order. This is, I can't figure this out. This is too encrypted. It's all over the place. Plus, there's not to mention on top of that, I told you how many passages about Moses, if anybody remembers. About 70 passages. Guess what? They're not in one place. They're all over the place. And even they aren't in chronological order. They're in all kinds of order. And you're like, how is this a book? How is this a book? I don't get it. That's how I felt when I first read the book. <coughs> In English translation. I'm, I'm not an Arab, I don't know Arabic, so all I could do was read the English translation. Then I decided, I don't know what bug crawled in my brain, I decided somehow I was motivated, I'm gonna learn Arabic. I'm gonna learn enough Arabic to read this book without translation. That's what I decided to do. And so this was the year, 1999, that I had the good fortune and Allah's grace to gift me with a really, really talented teacher. I was going to school full time, I was working full time, and I was studying Arabic three hours a day with this teacher of mine. So I had basically 18 hour days. 
okay, studying Arabic just to understand the Quran. That was my sole purpose. I did not want to speak in Arabic. I did not want to order a shawarma in Arabic. I did not want to travel to the Arab world to hang out with Arab friends. That was not my motivation. My only motivation was directly understanding this text without the filter of translation. Long story short, it's been since that I'm studying Arabic. And it's been since that I've been studying the Quran. And when I got a little taste of understanding the Quran in Arabic, I realized something incredible. I realized this book is organized and this language, this discourse of the Quran is organized in a way no other book has ever been organized. It is unique in every form. And it has certain literary nuances that you cannot compare to other literature if you want to appreciate them. You have to look at it on its own terms. You know how sometimes, it's not a good parallel, but I think it will give you some idea. Sometimes somebody invents a new kind of music. And the first time people hear it, they're like, what is that? And then it becomes rock and roll. You understand? Like some, somebody does something that's never been done before. There are elements of previous precedences, precedence, but it's something entirely new and unique. And you cannot judge it on the merits of Mozart. It's different. It's not what it was. It's, it's, it's still music, but it's something else. It's kind of like that. Quran is literature, but it does not, is not conform to the standards that you might be used to from other texts. So I want to highlight to you today what makes the Qur'an unique and to me personally mesmerizing. I, to this day, am mesmerized by this book. The more I study it, the more I just sit back and go, whoa, word of God. That's what I do personally. I don't put, push that on, down and shove that down anybody else's throat. I do this for my own fascination. Islamic studies, incidentally, for those of you who don't know, Islamic studies is many subjects. When somebody says they want to study Islam, they can study a slew of subjects. About, from since 1990, almost 15 years ago, I decided I'm just going to study Arabic and the Quran. And I've been so fascinated by these two subjects that I haven't studied anything else. I, I have questions about other subjects in Islam. Hadith studies, Sirah studies, history studies. There are other studies. Legal studies, Sharia studies, theology studies. When I have questions about them, I ask my friends that are scholars in those fields. And their answers are enough for me. I have a 101, 201 type understanding of those subjects. But the Quran, I just, wait, wait, I couldn't help myself. I just couldn't help myself. So I want to share some of that stuff with you. To give you, you know, some idea of how the Quran is unique <laughs> literature. I told you, was it originally oral tradition or written tradition? Oral. 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 oral tradition. Oral tradition. So first thing that fascinates me about this book, it's an oral text. Now you tell me. Is it harder to preserve an oral tradition or a written tradition? Oral. oral tradition. It is clearly more difficult to preserve an oral tradition. Everybody agree here? Mm -hmm. Okay. To give you an example, if I was to whisper something in Erica's ear, and I asked her to whisper it to the person before, the person before, and we go around the room, and we get to the last person, and I said to Erica, Bob pushed Joe. And she whispered it, and then she whispered it, and then he whispered it, and they kept going around. What was the original sentence? Bob. By the time we get to the end, Bob burned Joe's house down and destroyed his car and killed the whole village, everybody in the village. Something happens in oral tradition. Nobody intentionally changed the message. Somebody just decided to say it in their own words and change half a percent. Somebody else, another half percent. Somebody else, one percent. Somebody else, two percent. One and two percent is harmless, isn't it? But when it's passed through enough people, it becomes unrecognizable. This kind of experiment is done in communication psychology all the time. Oral tradition is almost impossible to preserve. And the more it travels, the more it varies. Isn't that the case? The more it it's only logical. The more it travels, the more it varies. Now, by comparison, written tradition is safe. But not entirely safe. It's not like they had backup scans and, you know, cloud drives back then. So even if you have a written book, a page could get smudged, a page could get ripped, the book could get torn. It might have to be rewritten for memory, right? So even if you have a written archive, it still may not be 
intense some skepticism about the authenticity of a text. Logical, in my opinion, that you can have skepticism about what the origins of a text are. The argument of the Qur'an, interestingly enough, by the claim of the Prophet himself and those around him, and back actually even some of the skeptics of his own time, how can he receive a book he can't even read? <clears throat> the problem of him not being able to write the book is clear. He can't even read. How can he write? So it was only a, an, an oral expression. On top of that, when the book is actually compiled, it's compiled in a way that's not oral. It's written now. But it's not in the oral order as I mentioned, right? Which adds another layer of complexity. Here's what's fascinating. By the time this man's career, the Prophet's career, 23 years as a messenger, by the time it's over, between 10 and 100,000 people have been, are becoming Muslim. The vast majority of them are memorizing, or a huge chunk of them, a couple of thousand of them are memorizing the entire Quran by heart, which is the equivalent today of about 600 pages. The most popular tradition in the Muslim world today is the memorization of the entire Quran. These people not just memorize the Quran, they travel far and wide. They leave the Arabian lands. They are cut off from the mainland. That, you know, it's not like they're connect, staying in touch by email either. This is ancient time. So once you're cut off, you're cut off. And if you want to send a message, it might take a couple of months. Because horses take their time. Right? These people move out and they're teaching Quran in their own villages, their own towns. If you go from a logical perspective, then the assumption should be that in, within a year, within two years, you should have a thousand Qur'ans. That's what you should have. You should have an uncountable number of variations of an oral tradition. That's what you should get. Fast forward to 2013, today. The Urbi Mosque has a Qur'an memorization program. There are children here that memorize the Qur'an. My daughter memorizes the Qur'an part-time. I memorize the Quran part time. I've memorized about half of it part time. And I'm a lazy bum. I should have finished it by now. But I memorize it part time. Not because I have photographic memory, because it's something about this Quran, it's easy to memorize. It's easy, and honestly, it's crazy. Now, here's the even crazier part I memorize certain passages from the Quran. I travel to Malaysia. I don't speak Malay. I go and lead prayer. And when we lead prayer, we recite a passage from the Quran from memory. I go and lead prayer. I recite the passage out loud. There are a bunch of kids behind me that have memorized the Quran. I mispronounce one word. Three kids correct me. <laughs> no, it's this way. I don't speak their language. We've never met before. They saw me praying at the airport, so they joined me in prayer. That's what Muslims do. If the Muslims see you praying, and it's time for prayer, they can join in you and stand behind you in prayer. So we pray in congregation, even if we don't know each other. That's how it works. And the, the longest part of our prayer is standing, and in standing we recite the Qur'an from memory. And if one guy messes up one word, one syllable of one word, one syllable of one word, the three in the back, no, no, it's actually, and you go, oh, and you correct yourself. By the syllable, by the syllable. Here's an even crazier fact of life. We're living in Irving, or I live in Ulysses at least, but we're in Irving right now. Imagine all the internet is, internet is gone, all the libraries are gone, all the books are gone, all the cell phones are gone, all the computers are gone. Every, every data, all the data in Irving is gone. Okay? The phone book's gone, the, there's no copies of the US Constitution, there's no copies of the Bible, no copies of anything. No book, no data. I can challenge that within 24 hours we'll have the Quran. In Irving. In Irving. Actually, we don't even have to look at all of Irving within five blocks of here. We'll have the entire Quran back. Why? Yep. And when they reproduce it in writing, because they'll handwrite the whole thing, I, we, got, we got a bunch of kids, so each will take one page and we'll be done. Right? And when they're done, and they match it to a library copy of the Quran, guess what? Same thing, by the syllable, by the full stop by the comp. That fascinates me. Hmm. How can a book be this power, this, this ingrained into the hearts of human beings? That it can be recovered like that. And this is not just an Irving thing. I could do that in Euless. I could do it in Fort Worth. I could do it even in McKinney. You know, this is insane. It fascinates me that an oral tradition is this well protected and this unified where logically it should have really millions of versions, really. And that's, that's a logical assumption. 
Because the written tradition got unified a lot later. The memorized tradition was, was there for a long time, for a very, very long time. In any case, it is, a, is a, it is an oral tradition. I told you the Prophet did not have what capability? What did I mention? He couldn't what? Right. Oh, okay, he couldn't write. Oh, yeah, he couldn't write. So now, a surah, how many surahs? 114. 114. They're long and short. Some are long, some are short. The longest one is 286 verses. I'm using verses for you. I wouldn't use verses. But for you, 286 verses. It didn't all come at the same time. As a matter of fact, a little bit of that surah came down. And while it was being revealed, some verses from some other surah also came down. And some verses from some other surah also came down. And the Prophet would recite, and he would tell his companions, actually, these verses belong in this surah, and those verses belong in that surah, and this one belongs here. And he would do this continuously. So he's got 20 surahs, all of them partial, all of them coming down little by little, right? And he's telling his companions what goes where. And he has no paper in front of him. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter, because he can't read. So all of this hap is happening orally. Then it's all said and done. Now it's a book. And it seems like it doesn't have chronological order, size order. It doesn't have subject order. Remember all of that? Mm -hmm. So I get to the longest surah, which took, according to historians of the Quran, it took 10 to 12 years for this surah to come down. While this was coming down, a good chunk of the Quran also came down, other surahs. This came down, people memorized it. They didn't have verse numbers. Now I say it's got 286 verses. <coughs> I say that because a printed version of the Quran has verse numbers on it. Right? But the original, did they have verse numbers? No. No. And they didn't talk to each other about, hey, haven't you heard verse 43, uh, chapter 5? They didn't talk like that. They didn't have the scheme. They just recited it. Now they have this tradition of the of Surah al Baqarah, this is the second surah, this long surah. And one day I'm just studying and I'm looking at one of the nuances, one of the literary nuances of this book. What's half of one or two eighty six? What's half of two eighty six? Good, one forty three. Math makers here. Okay, one forty three. The one hundred and forty third verse of this book says, "This chapter says we made you a middle nation." The word "middle" is not mentioned anywhere else in the entire chapter except in the middle verse of an oral tradition revealed over 10 years that didn't have verse numbers. This, what I put in front of you, is what's called, it's a, it's a rough summary of one verse. It's a rough summary of one verse. It's called Ayatul Kursi, the, the, the verse of the throne. It talks about God's attributes. It's made up of nine sentences. One verse made up of how many? It's nine. nine sentences. Now stay with me. The first sentence is Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum God, there is no one to be worshipped or obeyed in any way, shape, or form except He. He is the living, the maintainer of qayyum. He maintains all things. Nothing stays intact until He keeps it intact. That's the first sentence. That first sentence mentions two attributes of God. The first of them is the living, and the second, the maintainer. The second sentence says, La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. Drowsiness does not get a hold of Him, neither does sleep. Now, drowsiness meaning the stage before sleep, sleep, and soon to follow, right? Like this, the thing you feel when you're sitting in a classroom. Drowsiness, and then comes the sleep, right? Then he says, Lahuma fissama, that's second sentence. If you're not clear about a sentence, let me know. Third sentence, Lahuma fissama wa fiuma fil alb means he owns all that is in the skies of the earth. I summarize that as owns all. Okay? He owns whatever lies in the skies of the earth. Fourth sentence, who will make intercession? I'll explain the word intercession, because I didn't get it the first time I read it in translation. So I'm guessing some of you won't get it either. Who will intercede on his behalf except by his permission? What that means is, when you get in trouble at your job, and you're about to be fired, but the manager is your uncle, and so he steps in between the CEO and you and says, hey, hey, hey it's my nephew. Just give him one more chance. Let's go easy on He just interceded. <coughs> he interceded. You were about to get in trouble. You had a good hookup, who was your uncle, and he, he helped you out there. Okay? Or you just got pulled over. Police officer shows up at the window, and you're trying to get out of the ticket. He's a nice hat officer. Didn't work. And then you're taking out your license, and yo, by the way, my brother is a cop. Oh, yeah? What precinct? Oh, I know Frank. 
Okay, just be careful, all right? <laughs> that little ID card from Frank interceded. You understand? When you have, when you use someone to kind of get you out of trouble, that's intercession. He says, who dare intercede before God except the one he gives permission to intercede? Nobody's going to come and say, hey, Lord, oh, Lord, I'm going to throw him in hell. Hold on there. He's with me. Not going to happen. Unless he will allow that to happen. Except by his permission. Okay. So he mentions something that won't happen, but mentions a small exception. And we don't know what that exception means yet. It just says that, except by his permission. That's all, that's all he says. That's your fourth sentence. The fifth sentence is, he knows what lies ahead of them, meaning what's in their future. And whatever's behind them, meaning they're what? Past. He knows their future, he knows their past. Then he says, And they, they control, they encompass nothing of his knowledge, except what he lets them know. He knows all, we know nothing, and whatever we know is because he lets us know. So what we know is the exception. The little that he let us know. Okay. Then, he says, وَسِيَعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ His magnificent throne expands the entire skies and the earth, meaning all existence is actually under his kingdom, his, his throne. Now a throne is a very small part of a castle. It's the innermost part of a castle. The throne is small. And you can have a larger or grand throne, but still it's a very small architectural piece inside a castle. God says his throne itself is the span of the universe. The throne. What to speak of the castle. That's what he, he's, he's describing his magnificent glory here. In any case, then he says, Guarding the skies. Guarding the skies and guarding the earth. Guarding the heavens and the earth doesn't exhaust him. Now, the idea of exhaustion is associated with protection. What do you find security guards doing in action movies all the time? <coughs> That's how you build a piece? Pass through security, huh? Security guard falls asleep. When you're guarding, your tendency to fall asleep. He says guarding the skies and the earth does not put him to, or doesn't exhaust him. <laughs> then he says, <laughs> And he is the all high, the great. That's the last sentence. Are they nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Everybody see nine sentences? Here's what's cool about this. The first sentence had two attributes of God. The ninth sentence has two attributes of God. You see that? The second sentence says, he doesn't get hit with drowsiness or sleep. And drowsiness and sleep are directly associated with what? Eighth sentence. What is that? Exhaustion. The third sentence says, he owns everything. And the third last sentence says, his throne extends to everything. The fourth sentence says, nobody will make a case in front of him except, and here's the exception, <coughs> if he gives permission. The fourth last sentence says, what does it say? They know nothing except what he lets them know. A sentence about exception here, a sentence about exception there. And the middle sentence conveniently says, he knows everything that lies ahead, and what lies behind. It's actually even almost in a literary sense, he knows the sentences that are coming, and what were already mentioned. They're symmetrical. This is not an isolated incident in the Quran. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples of literary nuance in the Qur'an like this. And this is just one aspect of Qur'an's literary nuance. I want to give you another. This is an oral tradition, as I mentioned before. And in an oral tradition, when something gets memorized, you don't change its order. You just say it like it is. You repeat it hundreds of times. So there is no time for an editorial process. There's no time. One of my favorite declarations in the Qur'an is وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Roughly translated, Declare the greatness only of your master. Um, can you write that for me in Arabic on the screen? Separated letters, please. You know what I'm going to do, right? But while you're doing that, I'll go to something else for a little bit. What do you want? I'll just erase this. The Quran, for example, I'll give you another really neat example of how the Quran is organized. You have in the Quran several stories. One of the story, one of my favorite stories is the story of Joseph. Story of Joseph. And that's the twelfth surah of the Quran is dedicated to the story of Joseph. Okay. You want this in Arabic? Oh yeah. Well, let me try. Okay. Don't you erase that? I'm tempted. 
You forgot a cough. Find bad marker. Yeah, what's that? You forgot a cough after the cough. Uh, yeah, cough. Yeah. Ah. And let me fix this now. Okay. I know it's really hard to see, but I'll try to explain this to you anyway. Then I'll come back to the story of Joseph. It says, Oh, thank you. That's great. Declare the greatness only of your master. Declare the greatness only of your master is what the verse says. It's one among many verses. It's a part of a conversation. So it's like a, I'm taking one sentence out of a passage, really, right? That's a beautiful declaration. Declare the greatness only of your master. Nothing else is worthy of having its greatness declared like your Lord does. The cool thing about this is, even if you don't know how to read Arabic, I, I wrote this, this is actually separated letters. Arabic letters are written connected, but I actually block lettered them, I separated them out to make a point to all of you. You see that first shape over there? That's like the letter R to them in the word Rab. It's the first letter of the verse, or of the sentence, at least in the verse. What's the last letter? You see a similar shape? Then there's two bolts with dots at the bottom. Notice the end? Two bolts with dots at the bottom. Then there's this weird Superman thing. <laughs> and skip a letter and there's another weird Superman thing. The sentence itself is what's called a palindrome. A palindrome in English is Bob. I just, well, race car. Anna. Huh? Anna. Anna. Those are palindromes. Now when you want to make a palindrome, what do you have to take into consideration? Tell me. You want to make a palindrome in English. What do you have to consider? I will wait. I love letting good things get awkward. It's a thing I do. Get off of it. That's spelled the same way. Ah, so you want to consider spelling. Because you know when we speak, typically we consider our content. What are you going to talk about? But in a palindrome, you, you have to compromise your content and you have to concern yourself with your spelling. And once you concern yourself with spelling, you have to compromise your content. This is no longer going to come out in what you wanted to say, because now you're more concerned about how it sounds. That's what your primary concern is. So when we do come up with palindromes in the English language, clearly meaning, function, communication is not, thank you. That's not at our forefront. We're not thinking about that. The declaration is, declare the greatness only of your master. Is that a meaningful statement? Is that meaningful? Is it okay? Yeah. And it's actually within a passage. It's not a separate sentence and the prophet comes out and says, hey, look at this. By the way, he can't even do that. Because he doesn't know how to what? Read. And to be able to say, look at the letters, you'd have to know the letters. <laughs> he doesn't know the letters. He just says it. He just says it. And so we have, and this, this kind of thing was discovered like centuries after the Quran was put in print form. Like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at this. Look at this symmetry over here. Look at that symmetry over there. Look at this passage's symmetry. And I told you the story of Joseph, right? I was mentioning something about the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph, beautiful story. It's just absolutely fascinating in the Quran. 12th surah. It is in 12 parts. The story of Joseph is in 12 parts. The first six parts create a problem. The next six parts in reverse order solve the problem. The first part is he saw a dream. The last part is his dream gets interpreted. And everything works its way towards the middle in an oral tradition. That's what I mean when I say, and symmetry is just one thing I wanted to highlight today. Symmetry is just one of those things that people just don't know about the Quran. It gets lost in translation, or people I mean, like, who would want to study the Quran as literature? But this stuff fascinates me. Oh, boy. 
I get, I get just blown away by this stuff. I'll give you an example of something that doesn't have to do with symmetry. It has to do with how nuanced the language of the Quran is and how sometimes in translation stuff's missing. Okay. You guys know the story of Moses. You know this was coming. This was had to be coming. So Moses has to, he had a little bit of an extreme sports adventure early on in his childhood. What am I referring to? Huh? The basket. Those in the basket. Now this mother who's got upon her child in a flowing river, inside a basket that has previously been tested for extreme rafting? No. No. And has the poor woman has no choice. And she's gotta take this baby and she's gotta put this child inside the basket and let it float away. And as it sails away, a time comes when she can't see it anymore. She can't see it anymore. And at that point her heart sinks. And the Quran says, Wa asbaha fuadi fuadu ummi musa fadigan in kada tatubifi lola arabatna ada kalbiha di takuna min al mukmini. The 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 ayah the verse says the Musa Moses' mother's heart was emptied out. It's like she became emotionally paralyzed. She was emptied out. You know what that means? When you go do something so shocking, you hear something so shocking, it hurts you so much that people do this and you don't blink. That's the expression farihan. You're just, you lost it. You don't eat, you don't talk back, you're just quiet, you're a vegetable. That, you're in shock. You're just in a complete state of shock. That's the expression. Then he says, in kadat latubdibihi, she almost gave up her secret. In other words, she almost ran out of her house, her hut, running to the water and saying, my baby, my baby. But the problem with doing that is if she did that, who would find out? The soldiers would. That motherly instinct of wanting to run after her child, she had to crush within her. And that, in, that itself, first of all, the child's going, second, she can't even cry about it. She can't even scream about it. She has to fight her most natural motherly instinct. He says her heart was empty, voided out. She almost gave up her secret. Lawla arrabatna ala qalbiha. Then he says, had we, meaning God, not tied her heart together, had we not kept it together. In other words, she would have run out doing what she was going to do as a mother, had we not kept her together emotionally. Litakuna min al so she could be from those who truly believe. Now, the reason I mention this particular beautiful, beautiful ayah is because her heart is talked about twice. Moses' mother's heart is talked about twice. Once when it got emptied out. Once when God held it together. Right? You guys following along? Once it was emptied out, once it was held together. The thing of it is, there is only one word in English for heart. Heart. The Arabic language has a number of words for heart. And the first time her heart was mentioned, a different Arabic word was used in the Quran. And the second time her heart was mentioned, another word for heart was used in the Quran. The first time the word fa'ad was used. The word fa'ad is used in Arabic, the origin of that word is fa'ada, to roast. Fu'ad, a piece of flesh engulfed in flames, is called Fu'ad. God describes her heart as one on fire. In Arabic, when a heart is overwhelmed emotionally by anger, fear, sadness, rage, you name it. If your heart is overwhelmed with something, it's no longer called just a heart, it's called a piece of flesh on fire. That's what it's called. When your heart is calm, however, it's just called the thing that beats. Qan literally comes from alteration or change because the heart is constantly changing its position. It's beating. The first half of the verse uses the word fu'ad. The second half of the verse uses the word qalb. In other words, now in English, the first half of the verse uses the word heart on inflamed, engulfed, overwhelmed, overpowered. What was happening in the first half? When he was flowing down the river and she was holding herself back. In the second half of the verse, God take, puts the fire out, calms her down so she can keep her cool. Now is the time to use what word? Qalb, the regular heart, the easy beating heart. This is the kind of stuff, the heart, her entire emotional journey is captured inside two words for the heart. Her psychological state is being described by these two words. That is not seen in translation. 
It's gone. It's gone. You don't see it. There's no way. Incredible stuff. At least to me. Yes, I have to know. 25 minutes before I call them? Okay. So, last thing about Quran and translation. My personal project, as was mentioned previously, was when I started studying some of this stuff, I was like, man, people need to know. Not to, not to proselytize people. I'm not interested in converting people to Islam. No, I just feel like this is a monumental work of, uh, you know, a, a contribution to human, you know, uh, the, the human library. We believe it to be the word of God. That's what I believe it to be. That's what Muslims believe it to be. I feel like Muslims don't even know what this book is talking about. So many of us don't even know what it has to offer. So I wanted there to be kind of a literary education about this book. So when people talk about it, at least they talk about it in an educated way. Muslims or not. They should at least know what it's talking about, like, uh, and not lose out stuff from the filter of translation. And that's why I did the series that I, I did a video series on the Quran, just the entire Quran, walk through the whole thing. Like, just walk through the whole thing. And especially, I, I try to highlight the parts that are particularly controversial. Like, here's a fun quote from the Quran, kill them wherever you find them. It's from the Quran. I can tell you. You don't have to watch the news to hear that quote. I'll tell you myself. It says, kill them wherever you find them. And I love talking about it too. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know why? Because I, I believe if it's properly explained, without washing the meaning down, without watering it down, genuinely talking about the text in its original historical context, I have no shame in talking about it, and I'm actually proud of it, and I think any civilized human being would be too. That's what I think. It's just not talked about it that way. Is it possible that a text can be manipulated? Yes. <laughs> Tell me about it. Tell me about it. I'm sitting on the plane sometime, the person sitting next to me, I'm reading the Quran in Arabic. They're like, what you reading there? I'm like, Quran. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that makes for some fun conversation. You know? <laughs> sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's awkward silence after that, like, can I check my seat? <laughs> awkward. <laughs> or sometimes it makes for some fun conversation. Doesn't that book say to kill everybody? <laughs> I was like, well, you're alive. <laughs> what is it actually? What is it talking about? You know what? If it's maybe some other sessions, I might explain that stuff to you guys. Let's take all the verses that are quoted all the time that are used as a basis to say these Muslims. No, no, no you watch out for these Muslims. Look at what their book says. You know what? I don't like to play that game because if you want to play that game with any book, you can. With any book with any religious tradition. It's easy to play that game. But to actually go and talk to someone and say, I heard this is what it says. What's it actually talking about? How have you guys understood this for 1,400 years and not had a problem? And how come nowadays there's this chaos? That's a discussion to be had. That's something we need to understand. I, I honestly, in my final comments, I just want to say, this book deserves to be understood for what it really is, for what it really has to say. And I, you know, I hope I can make some contribution towards that. And I hope that you guys, the ones, especially those of you that are visiting us today, I welcome you to stay in touch with me, with the people here, that, the wonderful people here that have put this program together. I, I actually am not an official part of the mosque. I'm, a, I'm just a community member. Uh, my, my school's across the street. I teach Arabic across the street. Okay, that what used to be the old Nokia building. I'm an Arabic school member. Right? Right. But um, I come help out whenever I can. But uh, you're welcome to try and stay in touch with me. I'm going to leave my email address on the on the board. So you guys can shoot me an email. We can talk. If I get time, I don't get a lot of time because I do a lot of traveling and a lot of teaching. But if I do get time, we can get together, sit down, have a chat. I don't mind. I don't mind doing that. Because I honestly believe that if people knew that we knew, like Muslims knew non-Muslims and non-Muslims knew Muslims, we, we could become an example of of uh, communities that not only live with each other and tolerate each other, but actually communities that can cooperate with each other and show mutual respect to each other. Tolerance is not enough. Tolerance is not an accomplishment. I don't think tolerance is an accomplishment. I think respect is an accomplishment. And respect doesn't come if you don't know people. It doesn't. It takes work. And it will take work for Muslims and it will take work for non-Muslims, those that are interested in anyway. So I honestly, I commend you for making the effort to come and I commend you for trying to inquire more about this faith 
and the people that carry this faith. You know, I hope I was able to be of some benefit. You know, in your in your own inquiry, in your own journey, I'd like to open the floor up for 15 minutes of questions and answers now, and then uh, we'll call it a day because the prayer service is going to start. We'll start with you. Okay. Well, I have a comment first. Sure. Um, I found really interesting, you know, the thing about the, the symmetry and the padding rooms. Mm -hmm. um, to, to talk about the uniqueness of the current. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, with the translation stuff, any single translation for any book is going to lose sense. And sure. Any, sure. You know. Uh, for example, just in, just in Alaska, they have many different words for the word white that you don't have in English and you don't have in Spanish. My background is in Spanish, and uh, when I was able to read and learn a boy in English, it was amazing because you, know, you, you, you lose a lot of the stuff in, with the translation. Exactly. Now, uh, my question is, um, you mentioned a, a, a tradition before about that God, uh, he builds houses for everyone, right? Yes, yes, yes. But then you said that he already knows what's gonna happen in the future. He, he knows everything that's coming, right? Sure. So if he's omni science, so uh -huh. he knows everything that's happening, so he sure. knows that some people are not gonna make it already, right? Uh -huh. Isn't that a contradiction? Sounds like a contradiction. He knows some people aren't gonna make it to heaven. Why you build them a house anyway? Because he's all knowing. We believe actually, it's really cool in Islam, we believe that God is all knowing, but he also gave human beings to change the course of their future. We believe that prayer can change predestination. Part of our creed. Part of our creed is the only thing that can alter the change of your course of your future, because God knows everything that's gonna happen. But he can decide to change that course on one condition. Your, your request to him. It's pretty cool. It's a, it's a very unique uh, uh, nuance to the predestination discussion in Islamic theology. Isn't that opposed to free will? I'm sorry. Yeah. Isn't that opposed to free will? No. Like, because it's that decision to change what is free will. Oh, so we, okay, so the, the free will question is the oldest question in philosophy, right? Our, our response to it is actually very practical. So there's two issues here. We believe that uh, uh, guidance is a component of two things. Human beings making a decision and God assisting them. Two functions. But the first of them has to be the human being making his decision according to Quranic text. The, the, the decision to do the right thing has to come from you, then help will come from God. We don't believe success comes from human effort. We believe effort is the necessary ingredient to qualify for God's help. So if I, for example, am successful in my business, it's because I did a lot of work which qualified, that hard work qualified God's help to come. But it's not my hard work that got there, it was actually the, the divine aid that got me there. So that we combine both of those issues in Islam. Okay. Uh, yes? Can you very quickly, if it's possible, um, you said kill them where you find Oh my god, you want to know about that one? I've never heard that, so... Uh, so cool. <laughs> so cool. I'll tell you what it's talking about. I will tell you what it's talking about. So, um, anybody ever see Red Dawn? Yes. Yeah. The old one or the new one? The old and the new. The old and the new? The old one was better. It was. <laughs> the old one was better. I had the craziest experience watching Red Dawn. I'm watching this film. You guys know what I'm talking about or no? How many people don't know? Oh my god, seek forgiveness. Anyway. <laughs> okay. I'm watching this film. It's a matter of perspective, right? The North Koreans are invading the United States and parachutes are landing and they're taking over the, half the country and it's crazy and these poor high school kids are running up into the woods and their ta dad taught them to use a shotgun or something. And they're now considered, guess what? Terrorists. They're considered terrorists. And they're considered insurgents. Outlaws. And I'm like, what a matter of perspective. I'm watching that like... No, they didn't just make that movie. I mean, it's just a matter of who's wearing what flag. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Perspective changes everything. Now, the, the thing of it is, in the, uh, in the Islamic tradition, that's a new one. In the Islamic tradition, the Prophet, peace be upon him, peacefully started a call to Islam in a city called Mecca, at the age of 40. Invited people to this religion, started reciting the revelation that was coming to him. Some people accepted it, most people didn't. People got more and more offended as he continued to recite it. So there were attempts on his life. Then there were attempts on the lives of people who followed his faith. It got to the point where they couldn't live there anymore. So they had to actually secretly escape to another city. 
leaving behind their businesses, their homes, their families, some, in some cases. Some people were killed, tortured to death, while not fighting back. They make it to another city where they were welcomed. Most people did accept the faith there. A sort of conglomerate government was formed with the, co with the, co uh, the cooperation of Christian and Jewish communities. The demon society was formed. And then they started preparing for battle with the city they ran away from. Now, from a political science perspective, they have every right to fight the city that expelled them because who, what's there? Their homes. They were kicked out of their home for no reason. They were, the, they were the ones aggressed against for no crime that they committed of their own except for believing. Nobody should be oppressed for what they believe, no matter what it is. Now, this is a universal thing. It's not just an Islam thing. So they're in every right. If the United Nations was back then, they would be okay with it. They would be okay with it. Now this war starts, and it's going on, and it happens, there are several battles that take place, and eventually, the Muslims win, and how do they win? They actually peacefully march into the city of Mecca with 100,000. They're overwhelmed by the numbers, and they walk in and they don't kill it, they actually pray. And everybody just drops their arms like, there's too many of these guys. And then the Prophet gathers all of the enemies, all the chief enemies that were in battle just years, a year before, two years before, they were out for blood. He gathers all of them and says, I will say to you what Joseph, Joseph said to his brothers. There's no harm coming on you today. Then Revelation comes. This is not the prophet talking now, it's Revelation talking. Revelation comes and says, these criminals that fought you all this time, give them four months. Give them four months to think about the faith. Take them to a place that's safe so they don't feel intimidated. If they decide that they want to be Muslims, fine. If not, they better not come back. And if they do, kill them wherever you find them. But they have how much? Four months. Four months. And in those four months, if you want to leave, go ahead, pack your bags and get out of here. If you want to accept Islam, if you come to that decision yourself, you know what? You're an equal citizen. And if not, you're not, you're not, we don't take prisoners. We're not taking prisoners. But until those four months, you are free to do what you want. This is the specific context of that declaration. It is not a universal Muslim foreign policy. It has actually nothing to do with what will happen after the prophetic tradition because we believe that the punishments of God, you know like the flood of Noah? The flood of Noah? Or you know, earthquake or fire from the sky? Or the town sinking into the ground? Those kinds of punishments come from God. You know when they come? When a messenger is in the flesh with the people and he's rejected, then God's wrath comes. When a messenger is not there, those kinds of unique punishments don't come on the people where they're annihilated. It's only at the, at the final rejection of a messenger. And by the way, let me add something else. When the flood water, water reaches up to here, up to here, in the case of Noah, right? The only thing about water is the nose now. Does God hit the pause button and say, you learned your lesson now? Let me take the water back down. You watch it this time. Does that happen? Does the fire rain from the sky, and right before it hits the guy on the top of the head, it stops. You would joke about that. You would joke about God's wrath now. You think it's funny now? Does it ever happen? Once it starts, you can't stop. This is a this is God's tradition in previous nations. This is true of Islamic tradition and the same stories that are mentioned in the Bible. This is what we believe. Now, in the Prophet's case, the punishment was not coming from the sky or a rain or flood or a typhoon. It was the Muslim army that took over the city of Mecca. And the God's tradition fulfilled all criminals who fought against the messenger should be what? Killed. Killed. But the pause button is pressed and told four months. The pause button was never pressed before. It's four months. Think about it. If you want to leave, move to Rome. Go ahead. Move somewhere else. Go ahead. Otherwise, you will face God's wrath which has been coming from previous prophets too. And this is a messenger, and God does not forgive those who violate his messenger's causes. Those who have been ardent criminals. It's up to you. Then a guy came up to the prophet and said, I don't know where you've been. I, I was in my house when you were preaching. I never came outside. I never even knew who you were until you just took over Mecca. <laughs> what about me? I mean, he must have had an Xbox at home or something. He didn't come out. You know, yeah. Session that there were two perspectives how to interact. God's and ours. Yeah. So anyway, he says, what about me? I didn't do anything. I didn't fight you guys. You know? 
And Allah says what about them? A specific verse came about the exceptional case. Listen, I was talking about battle, com com evil, you know, uh, war warring combatants, and I gave them those four months. If one of the other comes, what do you do? If one of, the, one of the idol worshippers comes to you saying, listen, I have no idea, I don't know what this stuff is. Then, فَأَجِرْهُ Leave him be and keep him safe. Ajirhu means two things, leave him be and keep him safe. حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ Until he gets to hear God's word. ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنَا Then, after he hears God's word, take him to a safe place. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمُ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ That's because they were a people that didn't know. That's because there are people that didn't know. People that didn't know, you are responsible to protect them. Let them know what this is, because they didn't know, but you're also responsible to protect them. Context. Without context, you can pull anything out. Without context, I'm running around after my child, playing with her, and I would say, I'm going to get you. <laughs> I'm a lion, I'm going to eat you. I say it all the time, maybe you record. Namal Ali Khan told his children that he's going to eat them. <laughs> We have a direct recording, I'm going to eat you. <coughs> did you say that, sir? Yes, I did, I actually did say that. <laughs> and then they asked my child, were you scared? I was really scared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> context, guys. Context. You know, it's so easy to manipulate a text. And the beauty of it is, when I see people manipulating the Quran's text, I find fulfillment of God's word in that. Because he says, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ He guides with this word many. And he mis lets other people mis be misguided with this word, many of them. And the only one who go in mis into misguidance by using the word are people who are inherently corrupt. Hmm. People that have corrupt intention will use it for misguidance. And uh, when they do that, I say, oh, you told us. Thanks. Thanks for the heads up. So I'm not shocked by it. Like uh, you were told. You were told. Yeah. You know, the Bible has many interpretations, like the King James or Bystander Version. Does the Quran have interpretation? The Quran's text is unified. So the text of the Quran is across the board the same. There are scholarly, scholarly attempts to understand the Word of God, and there are thousands in number. Thousands. But none of them are actually considered sacred. The difference between sometimes the biblical analysis or exegesis and Quran is that you know some like some biblical scholars will argue that you know these few lines are actually explanatory. They're not original Bible; they're explanatory. But they ha that line has to be drawn for you. The, the like a common reader won't be able to tell where the line where to draw the line. With the Quran, the line is clearly drawn. This is his word. This is my attempt to understand it. And what's beautiful about that is every time a scholar would write about a single verse and explain it in his to the best of his understanding, he'd end the passage with, with Wallahu A'lam and God knows better. In other words, what I'm offering you is a human effort to understand God's word, but my word doesn't constitute God's word. My interpretation cannot be considered final. My interpretation can't be the, the last. Because that would be taking God's authority. Yeah. yeah I've heard of the principle of abrogation, I believe. In the sure. Quran. Could sure. you describe that? Sure, yeah. Abrogation is the idea that God would reveal something where people were ready for it at a certain point, and then as they matured, he would re re uh, reveal more specific commandments, or commandments that would say, okay, now you need a, a, the, the final version of this. So for example, Arab society, you think they have a lot of uh, drinking water in the middle of the desert? No. Not a natural resource, not easily accessible. And in that kind of a society, all drinking liquids, juices, wine, etc., are very expensive to come by, right? So wine was a very exotic item, and also something that was very much you know, revered in Arab society. The Quran came and tried to wean the Muslims off of wine. It didn't say, don't drink. Because Allah knows, and we know now, we know now, you can't just tell someone, don't drink, and they stop. It doesn't work like that. Human beings don't operate like that. And he says, Allah doesn't he know who he created? He knows what we're like. So he first said, look, the, the evil that comes from it is much greater than the benefit. He didn't spell out and say, stop it. He just said, listen, it's, it's the, the, the bad things that come out of it are far worse than the good in it. Then he, a few years later, he took another step and he said, you know what? Don't be drunk when you're praying. Don't come near the prayer while you're drunk until you know what you're talking about. 
So to at least respect the prayer. Now the thing with prayer is Muslims pray five times every few hours, which practically, <laughs> either you're gonna drink or you're gonna pray, because, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. And even if you are gonna drink, you can't drink too much anymore, why not? Because if you drink too much, it takes a while to wear off. And prayer is coming. So if you're gonna fulfill this commandment, practically, it came to an end. Then the final commandment about alcohol came, and that was, it is رِجْسٌ مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ it is from the abominations of the work of the devil, stay away from it. Are you going to stop or what? That's what he said. Are you going to stop? Now this was the final word. That's what we mean by abrogation. In other words, something was given in lighter form, then more, then solid, then more solid. It didn't start that way. It didn't start, it's evil, it's from the devil, stop it. You know? I, again, personally, see it. Are you, you're free to disagree, I don't call you Satanic people if you drink or whatever. I, I, I'm not saying that. I see the I see the evils of alcohol in my community though. I can see it. I remember when Irving was in Dry County. And I, I can see the difference when it's not. I can see it. I mean look at the crime statistics. You can tell. You can tell. The effects of alcohol you want to know the effects of alcohol? Go to an ER on a Friday night. How many lives? How many lives? Oh, I, I believe it. You know, I, it doesn't it doesn't take me any convincing. You know, so he says the harm is greater than the benefit. Somebody goes, well, it's good for your blood supply, and it's good for this, or it's good for that, and you know, it's a good relaxer. Why well, you can't watch football without it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, well, you know what? God doesn't say the first step wasn't stop it. The first step was look, the harm that comes from it in a society is far greater than the benefit that comes. From it. The evil, the evil consequences of it are huge. And with that, we have prayer coming up, so we have to stop now. All right. Thank you so much, Ustad. On behalf of the Islamic Center of Irving, we'd like to thank you. Uh, you can write my email address on there, so everybody has it. So you guys, I'll leave my email address, and who will write it down in Arabic and Put that on the board, and we can take that. Hope to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Everyone, you're more than welcome to stay.